we want to make sure that all of our community hears from all the global leaders for the next 35, 40 minutes. Let's hear what AWS is doing in the end user computing space. All yours, Bill. All right. Thanks. And, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, my name is William yeah. McGee. I'm a solutions architect with AWS. And uh, I'd like to talk about end user computing. Our main end user computing product is Amazon Workspaces. And like many of our services, this product was developed based on years of customer feedback. And what we're hearing from customers is that people want to be able to access their company data from anywhere at any time using any device, while IT is trying to make sure that the data is secure, that um, configuring this access is not going to be complex and hard to manage. Um, and all this is in the goal of trying to improve uh, user productivity, right? So with that in mind as the goal, we can take a little bit about the way work was changing. And these statistics are all pre-pandemic, right? So even before anybody had heard of the word coronavirus, already 65% of employees were saying that they could be more productive with flexible work policies. You know, if they didn't have to take a day off just because their kid was sick, they'd be able to get a lot done that day. Or, or um, you know, me, I'm, I'm having a little work done in, in my house and, you know, I, I don't have to take a day off in order to give them access um, just to let them in the house. I, I can work from home and continue to be productive. And prior <laughs> to um, everything changing for us, already 43% of workers had at least partially worked remotely, had a day or so where they were working from home. Right. And there were 16 million people in the gig economy, temps and contractors. And the reason that's important when talking about end user compute is if you're bringing on contractors, you need a way to provision them um, access to your corporate resources that is secure and easy to spin up for them. Right. Some more background. Organizations, as we all know, have been turning to the cloud. They have already been investigating cloud desktops, about 76% of organizations. And 77% of cloud desktop users have said that they felt that this experience was more secure than a traditional desktop environment. Right. So with all that in mind, what we're hearing from the customers is that they want to embrace personal devices, they want to be able to support temporary and contract workers. They want to improve access for mobile workers, people who may be traveling or people for who on site might not be an office. It may be a um, construction site. It may be a place where they're doing inspections. Everyone is focused on security. And all of this really is in support of agility. And what does agility mean? Think about, again, early 2020. If you are already trying to support the way people want it to work, if you are already trying to allow them to work from home uh, when they needed to, you would be in a better position when things hit in order to be able to transition your full workforce onto working remotely, right? So that's agility. It's being able to adapt to the unknown, things nobody expected to coming, right? And why? what are some of the blockers right now that people are dealing with? Well, if you're dealing with personal computers, as has already been mentioned by some other speakers, you're dealing with inventory, you're dealing with physical machines, you're trying to make sure they're at an office where there are workers who may need them, make sure you have enough on hand, either as learner devices or to replace broken laptops or to onboard new employees. Um, if you're trying to support bring your own device, security becomes complicated. You're worried about what if people save an email on this phone? How do you make sure that that didn't happen, right? And scaling, becomes difficult because again, you're managing these physical devices and you're managing the location of those physical devices, right? If you are already trying to solve this using an on-premise virtual desktop, you may be dealing with problems about those upfront investments. Just like in the server world, if you want to have your own on-premise VDI solution, you need to think ahead of time about well, what's the capacity I need? Try to provision all those servers upfront. If capacity starts to grow, it's gonna take weeks potentially to add new machines to host those VDIs, right? And all that requires management. It requires managing the hardware. It requires managing the software installed on those machines in order to provide this virtual desktop experience. 
And again, when it comes to the cloud, everything is about being able to scale, right? So anytime you would need to scale out, whether the number of laptops you had or the number of machines, there's a, a long cycle in order to provision the hardware necessary for that versus if you're working in the cloud where you can provision things on demand, right? So how do we resolve this tension? Right. How do we support the business needs of work from anywhere on any device, accessing data instantly, allowing your employees to be innovative and agile with those IT needs of maintaining security, enabling that productivity, but trying always to keep complexity low, reducing costs. So where Workspaces comes in. It supports Android, iPhone, Windows, Mac, and I believe Chromebook as well. Almost any device that your workers are going to use to be able to connect to their workspaces. It's going to scale out with your workforce. What that means is it's just like any other cloud resource. If you have a new employee, you can deploy a new workspace instantly for them. Right? It's going to allow people to work the way they want and innovate around how they can be more productive for you. It's going to give you better centralized security and control. The workspaces by default are all encrypted. Right? And this introduces the cloud pay-as-you-go model that's become very popular. When you're provisioning a workspace, you're either going to pay month-by-month uh, a month, the flat fee, or you're going to pay a much smaller monthly fee along with an hourly uh, pay-for-what-you-use model. Um, and we'll get into later a little why you would pick one versus the other, but the economics um, Basically, if you're going to have somebody working full time with this workspace, it's better to just have it um, always on, pay that monthly fee. If you're going to have somebody who's using this as more of a disaster recovery scenario, uh, it's you're going to be able to save some money by going with that hourly cost. Right. So by using a workspace, you're not going to run into cases where people have data on their personal devices. They're connecting to the workspace through a client. All the data resides on the workspace. That connection, that data is going to be encrypted at rest, and that connection is going to be encrypted using SSL. And you can even import your own certificates for um, device authentication that you would have to install on the end user device if they want to connect to the workspace. It's going to let you use your existing tools. We'll show you a little later. You can make sure that your workspace can connect to an existing internet, can connect to any resources deployed in AWS. You're going to be able to connect it to an existing active directory. When you deploy the workspaces, you can either choose to have um, a new managed Active Directory service where you can add users or set up a trust with your existing Active Directory, or you can set up a, a Active Directory connector, which is a proxy to your on-premise Active Directory, so that when your users go to log into Workspace, they can use their existing corporate credentials to do so. You're not going to have to create a whole new user profile or password and you know, remember a whole new set of credentials. Supports multi-factor authentication, like Radius. It, starts to be any, it supports software management uh, applications, uh, either through group policies, through the Workspace Application Manager, or if there's already an SCCM software that you're using with your current laptops, you can port that to working with Workspaces as well. Um, and as I mentioned, you can, you can require um, certificates on the end user devices in order to connect to the Workspaces in order to make sure that that SSL encryption, that streaming encryption is extra secure. So I'm going to take a second and start to talk about Amazon WorkDocs. Because just like in the server world, you want to separate out your storage from your compute. You want to do the same thing with end user compute. So whereas you would have EC2 uh, set up with RDS or DynamoDB to store your application state data, you're going to want WorkDocs to store your files um, separate from the hard drive that's provisioned for the workspace itself. Think about it. You want to make sure that any files that are saved aren't going to go away if you have to rebuild the machine. Now that you're working with virtual machines, if there's an issue, you can solve a lot of them by just rebuilding the machine. If people are storing their documents on that machine, though, it's obviously going to blow away any work they have. In addition, by using something like WorkDocs, um, you can access those documents from more than one machine. So take me as an example. I have a workspace that I use for a disaster recovery scenario. When the coronavirus hit, uh, Amazon allowed anybody who wanted to to go through an internal web portal, request a workspace, um, and start using that. Um, 
I'm prior to the coronavirus anyway, I am a virtual employee. I'm a little over two hours away from the nearest office. So I wanted to have that workspace so that I could get up and running if there's any issue with my physical laptop. Right? Now by using WorkDocs for my files, when I access the corporate resources through the workspace, or if I access it through my physical laptop, I, I can get to those documents. Right? I don't have to figure out some way to share them. So as I mentioned, workspaces and work docs work very well together. Um, when you're setting them up, it is as simple as pretty much a checkbox saying when you're creating the workspace, yes, I would like there to be integration with work docs. And on top of that, if you are a workspace user, we provide, we provide 50 gigabytes of free storage in work docs per user that can be upgraded to one terabyte of storage per user for just $2 a month. Let's go through some of the capabilities of workspaces, some of which I've already mentioned, some of which I've kind of only alluded to. Right? The first is the user experience and ability to connect from almost any client. It supports zero client, it supports Chromebook, it supports Android devices, uh, Microsoft laptops, Macintosh laptops. It supports local printing from your client. So if you are using a, a Windows machine to connect to your workspace and you need to print something from the workspace, you can print to the printer you have on site, whether it's at your home or wherever you may be connecting to workspaces from. Right. Also supports audio input. So you can uh, you know, use Skype or Web WebEx through the workspaces. And when you're managing these images, right, you can create custom images. So let me talk a little bit about what that looks like. When you first create a workspace, you're gonna select a default image, like Windows 10 or Linux that you uh, want to boot up with, right? But when you wanna create a custom image, you can launch an instance like that, log in, install any software that you want to be on your base image that you're gonna deploy across the uh, organization, right? and then create a custom image from the, that uh, workspace that you were just dealing with. Very similar to the way AMI creation is, where you would spin up an EC2 instance and make some changes and then save an image of it that you could then use to create servers. Works the same way. On top of that, we offer the Workspaces Application Manager, or you can use any existing software application manager that you have that you use to push updates to your existing workspace uh, workstations. Right, And so what you'll do is you'll create um, that base image There'll be some small updates. You don't want to push out a new image and have to rebuild the machines for everybody. So then you'll push up those minor updates using something like Workspace Application Manager or group policies or, or whatever you're comfortable with. And then every so often update that custom image. So as you have new employees, as you onboard new employees, they're going to have all those updates already included in the image. Okay. Another extremely powerful feature of Workspaces is that like many of our services, it supports an API. And the reason this is important is it allows you to customize workspaces to almost any need you might have. But more than that, it allows you to take other customizations that are available and potentially launch those into your AWS account, things that aren't intrinsically part of the workspace service. And I'm gonna show two good examples of that near the end of this presentation. Um, but it can be things like how you want to um, create those automatic provisioning, like I mentioned I was able to do. That's something that any company can set up. Um, as well as various types of monitoring that you may want to set up that don't come out of the box. Now, what does come out of the box for monitoring is integration with CloudWatch, and they do this CloudTrail. So CloudWatch will report certain metrics around things like how long does it take the average user to connect to their workspace to make sure that there's not a high latency with that connection. Um, and CloudTrail would be used for capturing any logs that, that are created. When you're looking at the performance cost and flexibility, again, there are no upfront costs or long-term commitments. You're paying either monthly, full flat fee, or monthly with an hourly rate. Um, when you choose that, there's a slight difference in the way they operate. If you're paying that monthly flat fee, that workspace is always up and running and ready for you to connect to. If you're paying for the hourly rate, the first time you connect to it, there may be an additional couple minute delay as that machine is, is spun up out of um, before you can connect to it. Right. You'll be able to select from five different hardware bundle options. What that means is different 
uh, powers of CPU, different amounts of memory that are allocated towards that machine. Plus, we support two different uh, bundles now with GPU options for CAD workstations and other uses where you would want a GPU included. These are a little pricier, so they're usually not the go-to for your average corporate workspace, but we want to make sure that you have the option for them if your organization has a need. We also support bring your own license for Microsoft Windows 7 and Windows 10. Small caveat with that, uh, the bring your own license does require dedicated hardware, so there's a minimum of you'll need uh, to allocate at least 200 workspaces in order to do the BYOL. But when you do that, you can also import your image from outside of the workspaces. So um, when I mentioned that workflow before where you spin up a workspace, install some stuff to create a custom image, if you're doing BYOL, you can actually export your image from something like VMware. With a focus on security and compliance, these are, the volumes are always encrypted by default. Your support, it supports multi-factor authentication. As I mentioned, you can use certificate-based device authorization where any end user devices that wanna to connect to this would have to install a certificate that would have been um, deployed, uh, been sent out through your IT. And the service is HIPAA eligible, PCI level one compliant, and compliant and ready for compliance with GDPR as well. I want to take a moment. This slide gets a little more technical than the rest, but I think it's important to understand in general what the connection flow looks like with workspaces. Right? So first flow is somebody from the public internet trying to connect to workspaces. And what you'll see is happening here, first and foremost, I want to point out that on the AWS side, there are two VPCs. The top one is where the workspace lives, and that is actually fully managed by AWS. You will not see this in your AWS account. It's being managed behind the scenes for you. The second one at the bottom is a VPC that is owned and operated by you, the customer, and you, when you create the workspace, you're gonna select a VPC that you would have it have access to, and it has a second ENI that's a, an elastic network interface that is deployed to that VPC. And what that means, the practical uh, consequence of all that is when this user from the internet connects, they're connecting to a VPC where the security is fully managed by AWS, but then when that workspace is calling out to AWS services, it's calling out to the public internet, it's gonna go through the VPC controlled by you so you can create a network layer of protection for what uh, the users are allowed to access, all right? And so in this flow, the user, is first connecting over the public internet to an alt session gateway that connects to an AD connector, that's an Active Directory proxy um, that is in the VPC that you select it. That proxy is gonna talk back to an existing Active Directory setup. That's how your customers are going, or your employees are gonna be able to authenticate using their existing credentials because it's talking back to that existing Active Directory deployment. And then the workspaces as they're using the workspaces, they're gonna call out to any AWS uh, resources that are in that VPC and be able to talk back to your corporate resources through either Direct Connect or VPN solution, whatever you've set up to create communication between your corporate resources and AWS, the workspaces are gonna be able to leverage. Right. Now, if you wanna look at the next slide, that's gonna be, what does it look like when a user who's on-prem tries to connect to their workspace? And it's nearly identical. The initial, even though the customer is on a corporate network, the initial connection is still going over the internet and connecting to that VPC that is managed by AWS. The authentication is gonna happen the same way. It's gonna to talk to that AD connector before it uh, connects you with the streaming gateway. And that streaming gateway is how you're talking to the workspace that is gonna be able to, again, gain access to any of your AWS or corporate resources. Hey, Bill. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, there's a couple of questions that I think tie into this section, and hopefully okay. I will make sure I get this right. Um, I know Masin from Archer Dam in your Midlands wondered, is it possible to clone an existing physical machine onto workspace? So if you wanna do that, you would need to go with the uh, bring your own license requirement. Um, and if you do that, then yes, you can um, clone a machine and, and import it into workspaces. If you're not doing the BYOL, you'll have to start with one of our provided images, customize it from there, um, and then you can use that. So you'd have to kind of recreate that the image that you want to use. 
So I guess the answer is yes, there are some different options and, and Masin, I'll send a separate email to you and Bill so you can go through more in detail. Some other that questions was, were, does AWS support, and I can ask Matt or Igor to comment to make sure I've got these acronyms right, SAML or PCOIP? Yeah, so it is based on PCOIP. You can see that in, in the diagram here. That's what it leverages. There's um, a new protocol. I don't know that it was general availability yet called WSP that we've been working on as well. And the point of that protocol is it's decoupling some of what's going on here from the underlying um, workspace instance and offloading it to some other services in order to make sure you're having a more performant experience. Hey, Bill. And, um, mm -hmm. Bill Igor is specifically interested in webcam functionality over that protocol. Is that possible? Uh, I, you know, I hope you have connect him with me so I can verify. I believe the answer is no, um, but with the new WSP protocol, that is supported. Okay. So I, I need these details. I like on. to ha keep it interactive. And the final question is, and then I'll let you continue. I just want to keep this interactive. Let everyone in the Angel Bee community okay. know. We'll pay a little bit for questions. Um, what happens if you've got hybrid kind of environments or different protocols? Can you use AWS workspaces even if you're using other public cloud providers, maybe like Azure or GCP? You know, how does this coexist if you've got, if someone thinks, oh, this is interesting, but I've got some existing solutions and other platforms, can I tie together? How might this coexist with Citrix? Maybe if you could comment a little bit for hybrid, multi-vendor kind of architectures? So for that, I would say you got to be very careful about the specifics of the situation. But the answer I, I can give you is, in the end, you are going to be connecting to that workspace as it shows here, right, through that managed VPC. And then you're going to be able to control um, what the workspace has access to at a network level through the VPC that um, you're managing. Right. So if there's any resources that you can create a network flow to from a, an AWS VPC, then you can create a flow to it from the workspace. Right. So the example here then is going to be your on-premise setup where you're using Direct Connect or VPN to talk back to it. So if you have a way to set up a similar connection or if you have a way to connect to those things over the public Internet, then the workspace is going to be able to connect to it. I, I hope that helps. Got it. And again, for any... I think it's good because from a high level, AWS has a lot of flexibility to support your existing platforms where you can begin to implement workspaces in various capacities without completely overhauling what you have. And mm -hmm. for people who have questions, email me and I'll put you in touch with Bill because the devil's in the details. So you want to look at your exact solution right now and then see with AWS expertise how to make it work. Is that a fair summary there, Bill? Absolutely. Okay. So we are almost done. Um, honestly, I just have two examples that I really, really love that show the power of the fact that Workspaces is API driven. All right. So, oh, I did miss one slide here. Overall use cases for Workspaces, try and replace a VDI. You want to support a global works workforce, we have uh, 13 regions that support workspaces, so you can make sure that they're deployed somewhere where you're going to have low latency connection for just about any workers. Right. Project-based work, before becoming a solutions architect, I was part of our ProServe organization, which does contract work with uh, customers, and I can tell you the customers that I worked with that used workspaces had me up and running on day one. One of the customers that I worked with that was using physical laptops only to help with contractors, I had a 10-week contract, and it took them two weeks to get me up and running with a physical laptop. So just think about that wasted productivity right there. And as always, you know, if you're trying to meet certain security and compliance regulations, uh, we're trying to make that as easy as possible by making things HIPAA eligible, GDPR ready, and supporting PCI. Right. So now we get to those optimizations talking about we're short on time. So I'm going to go through them quickly because really this is a, an art of the possible moment. And I've got links where you can look into it a little deeper. The first thing hey, is Bill, I mentioned the idea. Got, that, Bill, we've got about mm -hmm. 10 minutes so you can. Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was off by 10 minutes. I'm going to yeah. slow down a little. Then. Yeah, we've <laughs> got you know, another 8, 10 minutes where I want to make sure we cover these important deployment kind of scenarios. 
Good, good, good. Because I, I'm sorry, I was thinking it was 1.45 is when it ended, but uh, Eastern Standard Time. So yeah, this right here, this is a self-service portal. And this is one of the huge powers of an API-driven service, but also a flexible cloud service, right? So this, if you go to the link at the bottom, it'll show you how to deploy this exact solution into your AWS account, but it's customizable. Right, but what this does is it creates a web portal where a user can go put in their name and email address, select a base bundle that they want to use. If you have customized bundles, you can customize this solution to only provide those specific bundles that you want to make available. And then they have a workspace within probably 30 minutes um, without any manual IT interaction. Now, this is just one way to automate it. Uh, another way that I've worked with customers to do is if you're familiar with ServiceNow, that is an ITIL process-based portal that allows uh, employees to go and request IT resources. So you could use this to request a traditional laptop. It would kick off some process that would eventually get that laptop to your employee. But now you can actually integrate that with AWS to automatically deploy this cloud-based end-user compute solution. All right. Um, this is exactly what Grubhub did using the Workspace API. And they actually used an AWS product called Service Catalog that is similar to ServiceNow. But using this automated process of provisioning, they were able to scale to from a handful to over 1,200 Amazon Workspaces in just two days. Think about trying to scale out that level of physical laptop if you had to do an upgrade, how long that would take, right? Just getting the laptops would take more than a couple weeks, All right? But with the power and flexibility of the cloud, it's almost instant. Another great project that I found is uh, an Amazon Workspace cost optimizer. When you use Workspace, is one of the important decisions you're gonna have to make is whether you go with that on-demand model where you're paying a flat monthly fee or that hourly model, All right? And the one that's gonna be most economic is gonna be different for different people, right? I currently have a corporate workspace that I use for disaster recovery scenarios, um, which means I've only used it two or three times in the past year. The most economic model for me is that hourly cost, is that hourly charge. You're going to save a lot of money going that versus a flat monthly fee when it's barely being used. However, if you are using it as your primary device, if you're using it more than three days a week or more than four hours a day every day, it's actually more economic to go with the on-demand model. Um, but even knowing that, it's not always obvious what the right choice is, right? If you suddenly allow 1,200 employees to provision workspaces, you don't know how every single one of them is going to use it. And that's where this comes in, right? This solution, and again, you can go to the link at the bottom, and it's pretty much follow the instructions, and it will deploy it into your account. It uses AWS Lambda um, triggered by some CloudWatch rules and Fargate scanning various CloudWatch data to see what the actual use of every individual workspace was. So it'll scan those, the metadata of those 1,200 instances say, hey, these 100 people barely used it. Let's automatically switch that from on-demand to uh, pay for what you use auto um, hourly model, right, and save you money. Or maybe somebody was on that uh, hourly payment and they're using it almost every day. So it would have actually been cheaper and seen slightly uh, quicker initial connection speeds if this was switched to on demand. And again, it'll switch it automatically and it'll review that data on an ongoing basis to try to save you money. So just think about how incredible that is and what, what other things you might be able to do with an API driven service like this. All right, um, case in point for what the kind of money that can be saved. Kiowa Kirin, which is a pharmaceutical and biotech company in Japan, um, moved to workspaces so they no longer have to guess size and scale um, when trying to create a VDI solution and moved to Amazon workspaces using that and things like that cost optimization solution where they weren't really sure exactly what they needed right away. They will save over 30% versus their self-hosted VDI solution. So Bill, so you know, some mm -hmm. other people are commenting when I heard about that, you know, when you might have labs in higher ed or kiosk or your own VDI, you know, the, the advantage of this AWS solution is much greater flexibility to eliminate things like in a library or a lab or a, a kiosk, something like that. It could be 
um, a very flexible solution that's much more easily manageable. Is that correct? So for something, and you know, I didn't cover it in this presentation, but for something that I'm hearing like the, the idea of this lab or a library thing, you the workspace is kind of like, um, this is your workspace. To some extent it is, it persists. Every time I log in, it's mine. But it sounds like those scenarios, you'd want to take a look at the AWS App Stream 2.0. That is um, a more ephemeral service that streams applications. So if you have like a library where um, you have uh, some sort of electronic card catalog that you want to access to, and it's traditionally a desktop application, you know, you're not going to take the time to turn this into a web app. You can use AppStream to uh, set up basically a desktop with that application on it, and then AppStream will replicate uh, temporal uh, instances of that desktop to whoever has the credentials to log into it. Um, and I think if you're looking at like a lab where you only want to access it for a couple hours, you're going to want that same kind of experience. So I think that uh, AppStream is, is where you'd want to investigate. And is it fair to say, Bill, as we're finishing up here, when people have questions, you know, different industry applications, you know, kiosk in a university may not be that much different than a conceptually than a kiosk at a large department store, which is having similar kind of architecture. Uh, as people grapple with lots of existing hardware, software, Citrix, other VDI, thin clients, you know, the mm -hmm. the opportunity and and I know AWS has lots of resources, both yourself, to send me an email. I'll coordinate with Bill, who will bring on board the appropriate rep and technical expert to look at your individual scenario and then figure out here's how we coexist with Citrix, here's how we coexist with your kiosk to make it work in the most cost-effective manner. Is, is that, again, a good summary of what I want to encourage everyone to do going forward? Absolutely. If anybody has questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, even if I'm not the right person to answer, I'm more than happy to connect you with the right resources. Got it. That would be great. Um, so, you, with that in mind, this was just an overview. We love to prove how when we create these solutions, they are flexible. We're trying to serve almost any type of industry, whatever your business is, whatever your organization is, uh, workspaces can help you. Excellent. And I'm not related to Gerber technology, so I, I should feel like I should do a full disclaimer. That's another uh, family uh, unrelated to my family, uh, just like I'm unrelated to a Novartis who owns Gerber baby food. You know, the only thing I'm good for is Angel Beat, but uh, we do know Bill's gotten very positive response whenever he presented this. And I think, you know, the, the thing that we always like to do at Angel Beat is people associate AWS with cloud and infrastructure. And we think it's very important that everyone's aware that AWS has this great end user computing solutions that may not come top of mind when they think of AWS for like S3 and the like. Absolutely. And if you think about it by having the end user compute virtualized like this, we're bringing all of that scalability and cost savings that pay for what you use mentality um, that has revolutionized the way we write our server software. Right? We can bring all those same advantages to the end user compute.